Today, let us study the words of God with the sermon titled, It is not the world, but ourselves that we change first. With this subject, let us take some time to study God's Word. Who created this world? Among all things, is there anything that was not created by the will of God? Everything was created by the will of God. However, as the level of our realizations has not reached high enough, we habitually wish the world to change this way or that way. It is a wrong habit to want that. The great will of God in creating this earth lies in our salvation and our future, doesn't it? If so, this earth cannot be changed. It can never become different. If there is something that can change, what is it? It is us. Sometimes we complain and grumble when something is not sufficient, and we don't feel content when things don't go the way we want them to go. How good will it be if everything goes just the way we expected? However, there is one thing that we must keep in mind whenever things don't go well. It is to remember that this earth is the city of refuge. Can we do anything as we please in the city of refuge? Everything has restrictions. We can't do whatever we want to do. We can't avoid whatever we don't want to do either. This is what the city of refuge is like. The earth is the spiritual prison where the souls who have sinned are confined, right? Many times, I too wish the gospel to be done this much or that much. But when the gospel work does not go as fast as I want, I compose my thoughts and reflect on myself, thinking, what is God's will in this? Then I come to realize this earth is the city of refuge. I had forgotten about that again. It is only in our spiritual home that things can be done as much as we want. In heaven, everything will be without restriction. Then will we feel unsatisfied or complain? Never. Not only with the gospel work, but also in our daily life, there must be times when things don't go the way we want. Whenever that happens, let us remember that this earth is the city of refuge. If we think that, we will be content with the circumstances and environments we are now in. Let me tell you a story about a kingdom. Once upon a time, there was a great king. Since the king governed his kingdom very well, there was no beggar to be found, and everybody lived in peace. Then one day, the king suddenly wanted to go on a pilgrimage. Since the holy lands were located in isolated places, very far from that kingdom, it wasn't a distance he could reach in one or two days. As the king announced that he was going on a pilgrimage, Many people wanted to accompany the king because they respected the king. On the day the king left, many people were waiting in front of the palace. Then the king noticed that the people were all walking without any transportation, while he had a horse, a carriage, and many other means of transportation. So he thought, no, 
I need to walk like the people. And he got off the horse and began to walk. While walking, he found out that some people were barefoot. They didn't have any shoes. So, the king took off his shoes and went on the pilgrimage barefoot. The pilgrimage was done very graciously. The king could hear from the people about the hardships they were undergoing and also came to know what they wanted, talking with them openly. It came to motivate the king to reflect on how he was governing over the kingdom. After finishing the pilgrimage, he came back to the palace. The next day, his feet began to swell because he had never walked barefoot before. When his feet began to swell, he thought about it carefully. The king really loved his people. Then he realized that most of the paths he walked were rocky paths and none of them were paved. When his feet hurt so much, he thought of his people. If my feet are like this, how hard it must be for the people with no shoes to go on a pilgrimage. So, he held a meeting and told the ministers to cover every path to the Holy Lands with cowhide. While walking, I found that there were so many gravel paths and it hurt my feet a lot. Since it is so painful for me, how painful it must be for the people. The king doesn't go on a pilgrimage that often, but he knew that his people went very often. So, he gave an order to cover all the paths with cowhide so that they wouldn't be painful when people stepped on them. The ministers were stunned. There were not just one or two holy lands, but there were many. So if they had to cover all the paths with cowhide, more than thousands of cows would be needed, even if they slaughtered thousands or tens of thousands of cows. Paving the paths with cowhide was not an easy task, and it would take a lot out of the treasury. They knew that they had to carry out the king's order, but told the king that it would be hard to carry it out because of this and that. However, the king only thought of his people and said, no matter how hard it is, try to cover all the paths with cowhide. He didn't give up on his will. A few weeks passed while they were debating pros and cons. Then one wise person thought, it is good that the king loves his people, but if it continues this way, it will even affect the existence of the kingdom. So he went to see the king. O king, as a man of this kingdom, I am so moved by your love for the people. However, if we cover all the paths with cowhide, it may even affect the existence of the kingdom. So how about trying it this way? The king asked him, do you have a good idea? He said, if you try to cover all the paths with cowhide, even thousands or tens of thousands of cows won't be enough. So how about just using a little bit of the cowhide and covering their feet? Then it will protect their feet, won't it? In other words, he suggested making shoes with the cowhide. 
If we do that, we will be able to protect their feet with one or two pieces of cowhide, as big as a palm, won't we? Upon hearing that, the king slapped his lap and said, that's it, and thought, why didn't I think about that? So the king called all the people with the ability to make shoes and told them to make shoes so that whoever was going on a pilgrimage could come to the palace, receive shoes, and go on a pilgrimage in those shoes. By doing that, the problem was solved without slaughtering thousands or tens of thousands of cows. Also, the people came to love the king all the more, hearing about the king's love for them. It might just be a story, but when we cannot change the whole thing, when we cannot change the world, it works if we change ourselves. The answer is very simple. But many people foolishly try to change the world without changing themselves. What do our brothers and sisters think while preaching? We are preaching with a determination to change ourselves. Then, with what are we changing ourselves? The Bible says, God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, didn't it? Because we are preaching with the determination, if it is what pleases God, I will change myself. God opens the way beyond our imagination and allows us to establish Zion wherever we go. We are working, believing that this gospel will be preached from Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We cannot change the world. It remains the way it is. We cannot change the mountains into the ocean or oceans into lands. This is something that can never change. So we cannot help but leave the situation that is already made the way it is and should thus change ourselves. If we are changed, the world changes. As the king covered their feet with a little piece of cowhide, they could go on a pilgrimage without being affected, whether it is a gravel path, a rocky path, or a dirt road. Likewise, we don't need to strive to change the whole world, but need to change ourselves a little bit and enter the world. Then there, the realm of God will be established, and God's will can be fulfilled. Let's study about this through the Bible. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. What did he learn? He learned to be content. It was not because he became wealthy that he was content. Although he was poor and in hardship, he learned to be content in many difficult situations and circumstances. He learned to be content. In either case, the environments that are put in front of us do not change. However, when we change, the environments change as well. When we keep feeling unsatisfied, the environment also stays unsatisfactory. I once told you about this before. There is a glass that is half full with water. One person says, the glass is only half full. And another person says, wow, the glass is already half full. The glass never changes. The glass is half full with water. However, the minds of the people who see it are different. 
The mind of person A and the mind of person B are different. Two people's minds are different, even about a glass that is half full with water. If person A changes his mind, what will he say? He will say, it is already half full, instead of, it is still only half full. This is a mind to be content. Here in Philippians chapter 4, many different conditions and environments were before Apostle Paul, while he was going around to preach the gospel. There were people who didn't believe the truth, people who believed in pagan religions, the Jews who opposed and persecuted him, and people who accepted the truth partially. Nevertheless, he learned to always be content in those situations. The world never changes, just like the glass that is half full with water. When it is half full, we must change our minds, whether we will say, it is only half full or it is already half full. Depending on which side we change to, we can either be content or complain. We need to change our thoughts. We ourselves need to change. Yes, we need to change. In Judges chapter 6, let's see how God gives power and accomplishes His work when a person changes. Judges chapter 6, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Here, God was calling Gideon to have him take on the role of saving the Israelites out of Midian's hand. But when Gideon thought about himself, he found that he was from a weak family. He wasn't strong, and he wasn't more outstanding than other people around him. So, he refused God. Let's continue with verse 15. But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. I am weak, so how can I save the Israelites out of Median's oppression? This is what Gideon thought when he looked at himself. Let's continue with verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. God kept helping him and encouraging him. What was God doing about the thought of Gideon, who was captured with such a weak thought, in the situation where Israel was being oppressed by the Midianites? God is changing the thought of Gideon. By what? By helping him have faith. God keeps changing his thought. In Gideon's eyes, the fight with the Midianites was something unimaginable, and it didn't seem like Israel would win against the Midianites with all their power. However, God kept giving Gideon faith so that he could change his thought. It's like, this is how the world looks. If the earth is round, we cannot make it square. But what can make it square is your thought, your faith. This way, God continuously helped Gideon to have faith. So what kind of result came about? Let's see Judges chapter 7, verse 3. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. This is a scene 
we know very well, where God selects Gideon's warriors. When God said, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back home, 22,000 people turned back. Now, Gideon had to fight in the battle with only 10,000 men. But God continued planting faith in Gideon. There were 135,000 enemies, and Gideon had 32,000 people. The number of enemies was far greater. However, God made 22,000 of them turn back. So, there was no way Gideon could win this war unless he changed his thought. But God led the men to the water, saying that 10,000 were still too many. Shall we continue with verse 5? So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. Here, God said, except three hundred people, send back the rest. It is more and more unbelievable. They couldn't win against their enemies with even 32,000 people. Their enemies had great conditions for an army in those days, having good weapons and camels, a great mode of transportation. However, the Israelites did not. They would have felt comforted if they had a lot of soldiers, at least, but God kept reducing their number. Why do you think God did that? What was it that God wanted? Do you think God wanted the external environment to change? God wanted Gideon to change through faith. When Gideon and his men changed themselves, they were reborn as an army more powerful than 300 million soldiers, although there were only 300. Everyone was full of faith. Like this, God selected 300 men. Let's continue with verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you, and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. God separated them again. 10,000 courageous men remained, saying, We are never afraid. However, God selected only 300 of them and sent back home the other 9,700 soldiers to defeat 135,000 enemies with 300 warriors. This is something unimaginable. However, when their thought changed through faith, it wasn't anything hard at all. So, what kind of result came about? Victory came about, didn't it? Gideon's warriors were not harmed at all. God made the enemies attack each other and gave victory to Gideon and his warriors in the end. Everybody, if we keep looking at the external environment, we come to think, it can't be done because of this reason, and that can't be done because of that reason. If the external environments are not going to change, then we ourselves need to change. It means, if we cannot cover all the paths with cowhide, we must have wisdom to make shoes to protect our feet. If the external environments are not going to change, we need to change ourselves, right? Let's continue with verse 19. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon, while each man held his position around the camp 
all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Bethshittah, towards the era, as far as the border of Abel Meholah, near Tabith. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Ol Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Like this, a great number of people died in the dark. As the Midianites regarded their own men as enemies and killed each other, the Israelites were able to defeat 135,000 soldiers with only 300 warriors. God gave such an amazing result. Everybody, our God is the creator of the universe. God said that this earth is like a drop of water in the universe and like a small speck of dust on a scale. The earth is not a big space for Him at all. It is a very small space. We need to always think that we are living in this kind of a place. There is a difference between what seems big in our eyes and what seems big in God's eyes. Because the 300 had great faith, God was pleased with their faith, so that conditions and environments were made in which their enemies couldn't do anything. The environment we see with our eyes and the environment God is going to make are totally different. God can do it not even with 300, but even with 30, or even with three, can't he? Gideon had no faith at first. God helped him grow his faith, reducing the number of soldiers from 32,000 to 10,000, and from 10,000 to 300, and had the 300 warriors fight against the 135,000. In this situation, the external environment had not changed. The number of the Midianite army stayed the same. Their weapons and all the military supplies they needed for war stayed the same. However, as the number of the soldiers kept being reduced, whom must they have thought they had to depend on? This war is impossible to win without God. How can we defeat those 135,000 enemies with only 300 soldiers? We absolutely need God. The more their number was reduced, the more their faith grew. Therefore, if we change ourselves, we can experience the effect of changing the world. Let's see Numbers chapter 13, verse 25, and then move to chapter 14. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Descendants of Anak are giants. They even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then the people began to make a commotion. The cities were fortified and very large and the descendants of Anak were a tribe of giants. They already began to fall into the thought, we don't even need to fight, we're going to be defeated anyways. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb and Joshua thought that, but the people thought differently. It is just like the glass that is half full with water. One person says, it's still only half full. The other person says, it's already half full. 
just as these two people thought differently about the glass that was half full with water. Here too, among the twelve spies, the ten spies, except Joshua and Caleb, interpreted the situation that it was going to be impossible. And Joshua and Caleb said that it was possible. Why? Because they believed that God was with them. The two said, their gods have already left them with fear because they saw our God. They can't even dare to dream about fighting us. So what did Joshua even say? They are our bread. We will swallow them up. He viewed them as trivial beings, even to the point of regarding them as bread. Do you think Joshua did that because he was a very brave person? Joshua always kept God's promise in his heart. The voice of God who said, I will give you the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey, kept echoing in his ears. God promised us this land, so how can this land not become ours? If we go, we will certainly win. Like this, Joshua and Caleb calmed the people down. However, since the ten spies had already said many negative things, the people began to complain in the end. Let's continue with verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. The people said, Oh no, we're all going to die. Because the ten spies complained, saying, We're all going to die. The twelve spies were the heads of the ten tribes. They were sent to explore the land because they were considered to be faithful and strong. But as they complained, the people wailed all night. We are all going to die even before we enter the land of Canaan. Let's see chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. People come to say that when they are filled with dissatisfaction. That is why we must always be content. This earth is the city of refuge, and it cannot be changed. This reality can never change. It means that things just don't go the way we want on the earth. While living in the world, where things don't go the way we want, if we think, why doesn't this work? Why? Then we come to grumble and complain. Since Apostle Paul understood all these things, he kept learning to be content. The situations that he was in were not going to change though he complained. The external environments never changed. What needs to change is our point of view. Then, we can never have complaints in us, but have complete faith. Let's see verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will… do what? We will swallow them up. We will swallow them up. In the King James Version, it says, they are bread for us. 
It means that they are nothing, very insignificant. Because we will swallow them up, their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. What kind of people did God allow to enter the land of Canaan? The outside world had some great power that they could not dare to approach. However, Joshua and Caleb said, God is with us. Their great power is nothing in front of God. We can definitely defeat them. Because Joshua and Caleb had this strong faith, they were able to calm them down and said, They are just bread for us. So why do you fear them? Hearing that God is coming with His army, their God has already run away. The God that protects them is gone. How strong can they be? We have nothing to worry about. They come down the people like this. However, in the eyes of the people and the ten spies, the power of their enemies look bigger than that of God. So God thought, these people cannot enter the land of Canaan in this situation and made them go backwards. They could have entered the land of Canaan very soon. Seeing their faith, God made them retreat and wander for 40 years on the way to the land of Canaan. Everybody, when we see this history, we can learn that we must not want the world to change. Since this place is a city of refuge, everything that happens before us is difficult. Every condition is unfavorable. Though the conditions before our eyes look difficult, we need only to change ourselves, right? How can we change our perspective, which views the earth as something so large? We need to view this earth from outer space. When we look at the earth from Saturn, I showed it to you once before. When you saw it on the screen, how big was the earth? It was very, very tiny. It was as small as a grain of sand. We can't even see its shape. That's how small the earth is. No matter how big something is here, can it be compared with God who operates the whole universe? So when Joshua and Caleb viewed the enemies with the eyes of faith in God, they were nothing. They said, God promised to give us this land. So why do you think it is impossible? Everybody, please have the eyes of faith and remember the voice of God who said, This gospel will be preached in Samaria and to the end of the earth, and then the end will come. When we change, the world changes by itself. We often say, here people are so arrogant that they don't open the door. Here there are too many Muslims, so it doesn't work. Here there are too many Hindus. Instead of saying it doesn't work, we need to wait for the right time because there is a time God will open the door. If a person repeatedly says it doesn't work, it shows that he doesn't believe in God and that he doesn't want to change himself. Instead of viewing the earth from inside, let your souls escape from the earth at least once and look at the earth from the outside. The earth is truly like a tiny dot. Whoever he works through, God fulfills his will. Although there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard, how far will their voice go? In the book of Psalms, God already said that it will go out into all the earth. Everybody, we don't need to say, I want the environment to change like this. I want it to change in this way. Instead of trying to change the world, which will not change, if you look at the world with faith, the world will have been already changed. Let us change ourselves with that kind of faith. 
so that we can change the world beautifully into God's world. I hope this day will come quickly. Even for just this one fact, that our God is leading the gospel work, let us always give thanks and glory to God. By this, I would like to conclude today's word. Thank you very much.